Economic alliances might make the world more peaceful, but they could also lead to trade wars and cause tensions among countries within alliances. We can't just assume that, uh, that contact breeds uh, friendship. Sometimes contact breeds uh, conflict. When 50 nations try to export simultaneously, uh, somebody will win and somebody will lose. There'll be more tension, but I don't think it will lead to war. Proud America, dependent? Get used to it, some argue. It's inevitable, not a negative, just a trend toward global economics, as those countries who were devastated by World War II have rebuilt their economic might. America already has a large stake in the rest of the world. It's the largest outside investor in Europe, has been for years. And those countries aren't weaker. Many are industrial powerhouses. Is there anything inherently wrong with foreign investment? No, there's not. So what is wrong? It's the rapid pace of the buying of America at a time when the U.S. appears to be less competitive. For Bill Clinton, the fight now focuses on free trade, NAFTA. Passage of the act will lower trade barriers among the United States, Mexico, and Canada. It's supposed to increase jobs and exports, but some say jobs will be lost. A harsh critic of the plan is Ross Perot, the billionaire Texan. The bill is in trouble. Vice President Al Gore challenges Perot to a debate on the issues. Accept it. This is a major choice for our country of historic proportions. We've got to have a climate in this country where we can create jobs in the good old USA. Okay, right. like, that like, is one I'd thing like to, okay. that the president and vice president finish. could do for us and they're not. The White House lobbies hard and when the vote is in, Clinton triumphs. NAFTA passes. Could the new Europe be a trendsetter in a quarrelsome world? If we can do it, after having been at war for centuries, other nations can do that too? There's not the slightest evidence that this is true. It happened in Europe after 300 years of war. It's not happening in Africa. It's not happening in the Middle East. The Union has yet to prove it can hold in crisis, let alone lead the world. There's a new spirit in Western Europe today, a new feeling of unity, with a new flag to proclaim it, the flag of the European community. Young Europeans wear the symbol comfortably, and looking out can see their continent, where their ancestors saw only nations, and prosperity, where World War II left devastation. NATO leaders have been uncomfortable since the moment the old Soviet Union collapsed. NATO had been an alliance with a definite mission, facing down the Soviet military threat. But NATO is eager for a new mission. Leaders of Eastern Europe see it as stabilizing Europe and providing continent-wide military guarantees. Welcoming former Soviet allies and even the Russians into the fold of democracy seemed like the right thing to do but not so fast when it comes to widening the net of NATO's all-for-one and one-for-all military guarantees. NATO offers the East no promise of full membership, not even a timetable for it. The turmoil of Russia's October revolt and the strength of Russia's ultranationalists in last month's elections paint a new backdrop to the NATO summit. Boris Yeltsin's push for reform is likely to be slowed. And Mr. Yeltsin says NATO's overtures to Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic will only strengthen nationalists in Russia who dream of resurrecting the old Russian empires, Tsarist or Soviet. On the investment front, the Tokyo stock market continued its malaise as other big markets hit new highs. And the Japanese economy, after racking up better than 5% growth in the previous four years, tired, hurt by high interest rates. Other Asian economies also showed signs of slowing down, but still are poised to grow twice as fast as advanced countries' economies over the next decade, and in effect are moving toward the formation of a major regional economy, something that the political movement has helped as much as economic gains. 
there is already talk of a Northeast Asian economic zone coming into being, a grouping that could have some muscle including Japan, China, the two Koreas, and the Soviet's Far Eastern provinces. And Malaysia's Prime Minister has his own ideas on an East Asian economic group. We're beginning to see that the winner of the Soviet-American arms race is Japan. We're beginning to see that geoeconomics is replacing geopolitics. That is, that world power is now more firmly rooted in economic power than, let's say, in military power. Look at the Red Army. They have the Red Army, but they don't have uh, white uh, potatoes. Can you eat an army? Can you eat a gun? TV has penetrated the borders of totalitarian states, spreading the appeal of social justice, democracy, and human rights. This summer, in the USSR, it was the flickering images of wildcat coal strikes over abysmal living conditions and food supplies that stimulated that nation's worst labor unrest since the years following the Bolshevik Revolution. Violence and damage to an already battered Soviet economy were only narrowly averted when President Gorbachev announced new political power and generous concessions for the miners. He used Soviet TV. What we've done is shown people they can have a better life, and then they're going to push harder for it. Television is where some Chinese students first set eyes on the real Statue of Liberty before their replica arose in Tiananmen Square. Theirs was the first democratic revolution to be broadcast live on global television. It was the first to be yanked on camera. The government officials are coming into the CNN control room now, off the air. Goodbye from Beijing. Their mission, to compress space, obliterate time, dissolve national borders. What the people of Sacramento Street are doing is building an instant electronic bridge from the United States through what was once the Iron Curtain direct to the minds and hearts of the Soviet people. They've made the global village a reality. For the first time, computer messages bounced off satellites now zip between Soviet and American businessmen, teachers, scientists, creating partnerships between former Cold War enemies. The idea that certain states or groups of states could monopolize the international arena is no longer valid. What is emerging is a more complex global structure of international relations. An awareness of the need for some kind of global government is gaining ground. Gorbachev told a crowd of about 15,000 that the world faces new threats. Among them, poverty, global warming, crime and terrorism. Gorbachev called on the United Nations to set up a special group that would be able to prevent regional conflicts. I think there's a better chance of containing these conflicts and managing them, but not of preventing them. We may be going from a period of high tension, high stability, to one of low tension, low stability, where in fact uh, local thieves and muggers will have greater room to move around and in mug neighboring states. That, in fact, is, is maybe what's happening in the Persian Gulf with Iraq's attack on Kuwait. That attack has put the world's nations under pressure, the first serious test of crisis diplomacy in the new post-Cold War era. Initially, the response has been a stunning display of global unanimity, not seen before in modern times. This is a frontier of peace, southwestern Africa. Until recently, it was a classic Cold War battlefield, brimming with Soviet and American weapons, thousands of Cuban soldiers, and death. The war has embraced the whole country. There is not a single family which had no member of family killed, injured, or participating in the war. E apesar de terem destruído they have destroyed the economy and killed, murdered thousands and thousands of innocent civilians. 
Today, in southwestern Africa, the key to peace has been turned. The guns are mostly silent. The foreign troops gone from Angola. In neighboring Namibia, independence has arrived at long last. These are the results of a superpower diplomatic breakthrough, a momentous shift from a balance of power to a balance of interests, from fomenting war to waging peace. NATO leaders have been uncomfortable since the moment the old Soviet Union collapsed. NATO had been an alliance with a definite mission, facing down the Soviet military threat. But NATO is eager for a new mission, Leaders of Eastern Europe see it as stabilizing Europe and providing continent-wide military guarantees. Welcoming former Soviet allies and even the Russians into the fold of democracy seemed like the right thing to do, but not so fast when it comes to widening the net of NATO's all-for-one and one-for-all military guarantees. NATO offers the East no promise of full membership, not even a timetable for it. The turmoil of Russia's October revolt and the strength of Russia's ultranationalists in last month's elections paint a new backdrop to the NATO summit. Boris Yeltsin's push for reform is likely to be slowed, and Mr. Yeltsin says NATO's overtures to Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic will only strengthen nationalists in Russia who dream of resurrecting the old Russian empires, Tsarist or Soviet. They are warriors in search of peace. Their blue berets a symbol of the important role of the United Nations in settling some of the world's most bitter disputes. They reflect a UN reinvigorated by the superpowers who founded it after the last great war, largely abandoned it during the Cold War, and now in this new era of international cooperation are finally giving it more power to mediate the world's regional and internal conflicts. What has happened in places like Lebanon causes some to question whether the UN can make a lasting difference in resolving the tougher questions facing international diplomacy. Still, many question the cost and efficiency of the organization. Experts predict the UN's annual operating budget could soon skyrocket to as much as $2 billion, more than twice the current amount. And that doesn't even include the cost of peacekeeping missions. Soldiers are expensive. Peacekeeping soldiers are a millionth as expensive as war fighting soldiers. As far as Saddam Hussein being a great military strategist, he is neither a strategist, nor is he schooled in the operational art, nor is he a tactician, nor is he a general, nor is he as a soldier. Other than that, he's a great military man. I want you to know that. <laughs> Whatever he is, Saddam returned quickly to his old ways, using what was left of his army to crush uprisings by Kurdish tribes and Muslim dissidents. United Nations inspectors were harassed as they tried to ensure that Iraq was destroying its genocidal weapons and Scud missiles. And it convinced other Arab leaders that the road to peace in the Middle East is not through the battlefield, but across the negotiating table. Peacekeepers start enforcing a UN mandate to disarm warring clans in Mogadishu, Somalia's untamed capital. Hurry up! A blueprint for rebuilding a nation turns bloody. Peacekeeping takes another turn in June. The UN begins a massive manhunt for clan leader Mohammed Farah Idid after a deadly ambush on Pakistani peacekeepers. On October 3rd, more trouble. This time, United States troops are involved. A mission to capture top ID aides runs into an ambush. 18 Americans die in a fierce firefight. One is captured. <laughs> Helicopter pilot Michael Durant. Innocent people being killed is not good. Horrifying images turn U.S. public opinion and Congress against the Somalia mission. President Clinton chooses a new diplomatic course and a new timetable for U.S. involvement.
All American troops will be out of Somalia no later than March the 31st. Gunmen and violent clan rivalries are back on the streets of Mogadishu. If there were a top ten list of human rights violators, China would be right up there. What has brought this issue back to international attention are reports that Beijing plans to try several prominent intellectuals and students arrested after last year's pro-democracy protests. But from the use of force against Muslim fundamentalists to a continuing crackdown on nationalist agitation in Tibet, the notion of legal process as understood in the West doesn't really apply here. We're talking about executions without any due process. We're talking about summary killings of individuals by police and government officers. We're talking about arrest and detention for uh, crimes of expression and of, of opinion and conscience. Serbian authorities took a group of journalists to alleged death camps in northern Bosnia. Desperately thin prisoners appeared terribly underfed and generally in poor physical and mental condition. With Serbian guards looking on, all of these people were too afraid to speak of the conditions under which they're being held. Guards refused reporters' request to see the rest of the prisoners and their living quarters. Nevertheless, one journalist did smuggle out some photos showing evidence of beatings. CNN has obtained a tape that Bosnian officials say are interviews with two captured Serbian camp guards wearing Yugoslav army uniforms. The guards are asked what they did at detention camps in northern Bosnia. This 20-year-old says he killed four people, men and women. He says he hit them on the back of the head with a hammer. He then says he raped five young women between the ages of 13 and 20. He says that afterwards the girls were killed. Some were shot, others had their throats cut. Another guard says he killed an old woman. I hit her with an axe across her neck, he says. I don't know why we were killing. I don't know how many I killed. I was firing at random. And now there are reports that more than a month ago, officials from the United Nations, the International Committee of the Red Cross, the European community and the United States knew about the existence of Serbian concentration camps in Bosnia, but sat on that explosive information. The U.S. once planned a 13,000 warhead nuclear arsenal. The new agreement reached by Presidents Bush and Yeltsin would cut that to as few as 3,000 warheads each as early as the turn of the century. With this agreement, the nuclear nightmare recedes more and more for ourselves, for our children, and for our grandchildren. This would cut both the U.S. and Russia deeply below the levels of the as yet unratified START agreement reached with Soviet President Gorbachev. Yeltsin calls it unparalleled and probably unexpected, but for Russia, unavoidable. Russia, for instance, having half of its population living below the poverty line. We cannot afford it, but we know one thing, we shall not fight against each other. President Clinton has announced that Ukraine has agreed to dismantle all of its nuclear missiles. Following months of negotiations with Ukraine and Russia, Mr. Clinton said Ukraine's 176 intercontinental ballistic missiles aimed at the United States, including 1,500 warheads, would be dismantled. This is a hopeful and historic breakthrough that enhances the security of all three parties and every other nation as well. This agreement opens a new era in our relationship with Ukraine, an important country at the center of Europe. We're beginning to see that the winner of the Soviet-American arms race is Japan. We're beginning to see that geoeconomics is replacing geopolitics. That is, that world power is now more firmly rooted in economic. Goodbye.
God bless you, and God save this wonderful country of Poland. That was a time of faith and optimism. Today, Valenza charges that instead of Western investment, Poland was inundated with Western products. It was an immense mistake to have our country flooded with foreign goods, says Valenza. Some are nicely packaged, sometimes of a better quality. But this led to a situation where many Polish enterprises died because they could not compete. And the money and savings we did have, we spent on these nice glittering goods. Now we have unemployment, and we cannot respend our savings. We cannot buy any more. The 38 million men, women, and children of Poland are involved in an experiment. An experiment to show how quickly democracy and a free market economy can be established in what was once a communist state. We have opened the road to the toppling of the Berlin Wall, Poland's president told CNN. We have led the road to Czechoslovakia's Velvet Revolution. And because of our example, others can reach higher and have quicker solutions. But Lech Wałęsa says that because they are leaders, the Polish people must pay a price. All across Poland, hundreds of thousands of workers in sprawling state-owned factories are coming to grips with just how much they will pay. They are learning that their skills and their jobs are as out of date as their factories. And like the factories, some of the people may not have a place in Poland's future. For workers like this man, that price is too high. We were born poor, we lived in poverty, and we will die poor, he said. There is no hope for us. A new communist regime in Hungary supported Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev's perestroika reforms in the 1980s. And compared with her Balkan neighbors, Hungary's economy was booming. Western nations lined up to help Hungarians move to a free market economy. Hungary aided East Germans fleeing to the democratic West in the late 1980s, undermining the East German communist regime. The Hungarian Communist Party abolished itself after the government collapsed in 1989. I hereby discontinue my activities at the post of President of the USSR. Mikhail Gorbachev had worked himself out of a job and a country. But Gorbachev spoke of a grand accomplishment. This society has acquired freedom. It has been freed politically and spiritually. For three years, Gorbachev had been traveling the world, the evangelist of perestroika and his concept of a common European home. The converts were few, although some former skeptics signed on after the UN speech. That speech, in retrospect, was pivotal and the start of an unbelievable 12 months when the Cold War died or at least went into deep hibernation. Soviet troops really did leave Afghanistan by February 15th, capping a devastating decade of Soviet intervention. Gorbachev really did hold semi-free elections for a radically different Soviet parliament, a move towards his promise of a Soviet society governed by laws, not by Communist Party fiat. Gorbachev went to China, and his presence so emboldened the disaffected in that totalitarian nation that the old order needed the army and brutal, violent repression to keep its power. A visit to Bonn elicited a strange outpouring of emotion from the normally taciturn Germans, showed the Soviet leaders enormous popularity abroad. When he came to power in 1985, Gorbachev set out to reform communism in the Soviet Union, not to kill it or the country. Still, the USSR showed symptoms of fatal illness in 1990. By that year's end, all 15 Soviet republics had declared some form of independence. Gorbachev kept pleading with the Soviet people to stay together as a nation. He wanted republic leaders to sign his new union treaty. Gorbachev said it would keep Soviet power centered in Moscow, yet allow the republics greater freedom. The idea was put to a nationwide vote, and it won approval. Months later, in August, the Soviet leader was vacationing on the Black Sea, just a day away from the treaty signing ceremony, when coup plotters tried to overthrow him. Though Gorbachev survived, he never again had the chance to get the treaty signed.
It was as if Yeltsin could see the future lay of the land. He got himself elected president of the Russian parliament, and with that new power base firmly beneath him, he quit a party that he could see dying, and Gorbachev couldn't. And less than a year later, he stood for and won a popular presidential election. A risk Gorbachev would never take. NATO leaders have been uncomfortable since the moment the old Soviet Union collapsed. Moldovan President Mircea Snegor charged Russia Monday with pretending to be the policeman for the entire Commonwealth. We have to call a spade a spade. We're at war with Russia, he said. On Sunday, returning from his whirlwind American summit, Yeltsin said he favored negotiating a solution, but warned that Russia will not remain idle when dozens of people are being killed on its borders. Moldova has continually accused locally-based Russian troops of supporting the Transnistria separatists. The hardware, including tanks flying Russian flags, clearly comes from the former Soviet army. Should Yeltsin decide to send in outside forces to stop the fighting, Russia could become embroiled in protecting ethnic Russians all around the former Soviet Union. With a champagne flourish, the victors of World War II relegated to history the division of Germany and their military occupation of Berlin. Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev presided over the event 45 years after the Soviet Union suffered 20 million casualties at the hand of the Nazis. By signing the new treaty on German reunification, the Soviets are giving up their most important military outpost. We have drawn a line under World War II and have begun keeping time in a new era. And the plain ordinary people who breached the wall and who tore asunder the Iron Curtain shutting out the light put into the hands of these governments, I think, a very special trust. Trust that we could fashion agreements that would leave the Cold War behind. In touch-and-go negotiations up to the last minute, the Soviets won a commitment against stationing nuclear weapons on the territory of what is now East Germany. The Soviets also extracted side-letter promises that Germany not deface war memorials which remind Germans of their past and to prohibit Nazism in politics. The four powers have agreed to suspend their legal occupation of Germany on October 1st, clearing the way for formal unification two days later. When you go back to your students, what is the one impression that you'll take from the Berlin Wall? What will you tell them? How will you translate what has happened here in the last three days? Freedom. And I think it's something that for many of us in the United States, it's very hard to understand what it really is because we've always had it. These people have not always had it. And uh, I think I'll be able to talk to my students about uh, what it's like to lose your freedom and then regain some of those freedoms. Officials organized a huge anti-racism demonstration in Berlin two weeks ago as a show of strength against hate. But it was marred by radical leftists who chanted hypocrite and threw eggs at government leaders. They're angry that the lawmakers are working to tighten Germany's liberal asylum laws. The number of refugees pouring into Germany has doubled since last year, and under Germany's constitution, they must be cared for. The right wing's primary goal has been to kick non-Germans out of the country. Jews, gypsies, and others have argued that changing the asylum law will only encourage racist attacks. Brutal collectivization of agriculture was a centerpiece of Stalin's terror. It ruined Soviet agriculture, turned a thriving system of private farming into a state-run disaster. I think one of the most striking failures of the system has been its inability to feed people. The Zelenogradsky State Farm outside Moscow. Most Soviet farms look like this today, the result of Stalin's brutal campaign. Millions died back then, so did private initiative. The people who work the farms have lost the communist faith. We just don't believe anymore. Who should we believe? What should we believe? 
the workers at the Red Proletarian Factory welcome any kind of help they can get. They want to buy themselves out, to own and control their future. But they say more than money, they need practical help. We have no real experts on this sort of privatization in our country. I mean, those who really understand the market economy. The promise of billions in loans and credits means some help in furthering the reform program and keeping Boris Yeltsin politically afloat. People like Alexander say he is too proud for a handout. Let them show us how to work, says Alexander. Maybe then we'll be ashamed of the way we work and learn from the Americans how to earn money. There are parts of Africa, from Sudan in the east to Mauritania in the west, that are condemned to chronic drought because of their geographical locations. But the experts believe that no matter how harsh the climate, there would be no famines in Africa if there were no wars. People were driven off their land by having their villages burned, their crops burned, their fields planted with landmines, which meant that it was impossible for them to carry on any sort of normal way of life, and they were reduced to the condition of famine. The kind of picture that it always seems to take to make you and your government dig into your pockets for disaster relief. Well, here they are. Only this year, relief agencies fear not even this will work. There's just been too much else going on. What with the Middle East and with Bangladesh, uh, donors have limited resources and they've been committing those resources to other places that have also been crying for them. In 1991 alone, $40 billion was pledged to five Eastern European countries. That kind of support is needed also for Africa, but of course Africa is no longer a priority after the Cold War. Who really cares about Africa? In 30 years of independence for most Africans, Promises of freedom have mutated into dictatorships, corruption, ethnic violence, and deepening poverty. But Africans are now demanding change. They want democracy. Democratic reforms swept across Africa during the past year. In most African nations, one-party regimes have been forced by strikes, protests, or civil wars to allow freedom for opposition political parties. What is happening across Africa, most observers agree, is a direct result of the end of the Cold War and the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe. There's no continent in the world where the repercussions of the East-West detente and the Eastern European events is so visible and even striking than on this continent. Contrary to what our leaders say, there is a lot of similarity to what um, happened in the Eastern Europe and what is happening here. The images that stunned the world during the Great Famine of 84 are now reappearing, and the continent of Africa is on the brink of another similar disaster. The United Nations estimates that 29 million people in 20 African countries risk starvation through a combination of drought and civil war. The reason why we have uh, chronic famine really in Ethiopia and Sudan over the last 10 years is the nature of the governments that are uh, ruling those countries and abusing the citizens of those countries. And as those governments are the main force creating famine in those countries, we are contributing to the actual creation of famine in years to come. In such countries, aid can free up money to be spent on repression or weapons. Africa spends $12 billion a year on arms and armies. In the last decade, arms budgets have risen faster than incomes have declined. There are many people who feel that it is useless and free future for us to continue talking peace and non-violence against the government whose reply is only savage attacks on an unarmed and defenseless people. Mandela, who was 43 at the time of the interview, founded an underground paramilitary organization to attack economic targets, not people, he insisted. 
Mandela was already in prison on other charges in the early 60s when he and eight others were tried on sabotage, conspiracy, and treason charges. In 1964, eight of the defendants, Mandela included, drew life sentences. Throughout his imprisonment, the world had one glimpse of Nelson Mandela, the prisoner, as he walked down the hall of a Cape Town hospital where he'd been taken for medical treatment. But his face was everywhere, inside South Africa, where displaying his picture was illegal for years, and outside it, an international symbol of the movement against racial segregation that even the white minority government has recognized. Our goal is a new South Africa a totally changed South Africa. That government's new leader has indicated he wants to step up the pace of change in South Africa. How readily and under what circumstances he will agree to Nelson Mandela's old ends. The Africans require, want to franchise on the basis of one man, one vote. May depend on Mandela's new choice of means. Mark Leff, CNN, reporting. In a country that is normally very poor, it is not easy at first to recognize the line between self-sufficiency and dependence, between subsistence, staying alive, and the quiet migration to death. The sharp angles of the starving reflect the implacable geometry of their predicament. They teeter on a knife edge of survival, and it does not take much to tip the balance. A few calories, more or less, a few vitamins, a few seeds and a hoe, a few months of peace, a few weeks of war. There is not much time to feel sorry for these people. In a few weeks, maybe by the time you see this, they will be dead. The perennial refugees of Mozambique's long civil war do their dying mostly out of sight. Those who reach encampments like this are those who have had the strength to leave home and walk for days through the bush, which grudgingly gave them enough nutrition to die here instead. Twenty a day within sight of here, they say. They postpone death with manioc, a root that somehow survives when farmers flee. It provides some bulk, some carbohydrates, but it barely repays the energy it takes to pound it into meal. And many people here no longer have the strength to do that. dreams and only one land. Land the Israelis consider liberated, the Palestinians occupied. And therefore you'll find that those who are deeply loyal to the Islamic frame of reference find it impossible to have any form of reconciliation. Those who are loyal to the biblical understanding of Jewish history have difficulty admitting that there should be another people, Palestinians, in their homeland. Competing desires that have spawned one of our century's most enduring conflicts. The document signed yesterday calls for Palestinian self-rule as part of a five-year transition to a final peace settlement. The first part of the document calls for mutual recognition, which was done last week. It also gives Palestinians control of the Israeli-occupied Gaza Strip and the town of Jericho in the West Bank. And it calls for Israeli troop withdrawal from those areas to begin within four months. Israel captured those territories from Jordan and Egypt in the 1967 Six-Day War. Mr. Rabin, who was a general in that war, helped capture the Gaza Strip and West Bank. President Clinton, Prime Minister Rabin, and Chairman Arafat said the future must be changed for Arab and Israeli children. As far as Saddam Hussein being a great military strategist,
Today's children of Belfast hardly look up when edgy British troops materialize in the streets like a war movie come to everyday life. A, rocket, rifle to son of shotgun. a life full of alarms and alerts and places you don't dare go, punctuated by loud noises, the news of sudden death. Children here know they were born with enemies, the legacy of yesterday's children. Twenty years of what both sides call the Troubles have taken nearly 2,800 lives and scarred most families, Catholic and Protestant. In India today, more religious demonstrations, more deaths. Muslims are angered over the weakened destruction of a mosque by Hindu radicals. Today, the government arrested the leader of a Hindu fundamentalist group. Since the mosque was torn down, Hindu-Muslim rioting and a police crackdown have left more than 400 people dead, and protests have spread to other countries. In neighboring Pakistan, police fired tear gas to drive back Muslims heading toward the Indian embassy. <laughs> Retaliation attacks by Pakistani Muslims have destroyed or damaged dozens of Hindu temples. At least 23 people have been reported killed. In Bosnia, the United Nations mission is stopped dead in its tracks. The three-way fighting among Serbs, Croats, and Muslims paralyzes the UN relief effort. Human barriers halt convoys of food and medicine for Bosnia's desperate people. UN soldiers find themselves blocked at every turn. The United States and Europe cannot agree on action. At least 65 UN soldiers have died in the 20-month war. Trees mark a bitter battle line in the environmental war between North and South, between industrial and developing, between rich and poor. To cut or not to cut is the core of the forest debate. The North wants the South to stop destroying its rainforests. The developing countries like Brazil and Malaysia see the forest as a life-saving resource to be exploited. According to the United Nations, the number of people on this planet will double by the year 2030 unless something is done to control the exploding population. 90% will be born into poverty in the South's developing countries. But the Earth Summit will likely duck the population explosion issue, reportedly too touchy for North and South to reach any sort of an agreement. Religious differences are a major hurdle. The North wants the population explosion to stop. The South insists numbers alone are not the problem. A child born in America will consume 40 times more of the world's goods and resources than a child born in India over the course of a lifetime. And that's a major issue. Uh, the world cannot be sustained if the whole world consumes at the level of the United States. Both North and South do agree on something. Now is the time to begin taking better care of Earth's limited resources. Agreeing on how and who pays is the tough part. Preserving biodiversity. Curbing greenhouse gases. It's all going to cost money. The industrial countries have agreed to help the developing world pay the price, probably through a special green fund set up at the World Bank. It seems like a logical arrangement, but not everyone is pleased. Well, the bank has a track record that's abysmal. Uh, for 40 years in both economics and in the environmental impacts and uprooting people and in many cases causing total destitution of entire areas. Example, bank-funded logging that destroyed hundreds of acres of Brazilian rainforest. Efforts to promote cattle ranching in Botswana proved disastrous for native wildebeest. Fences kept them from reaching their watering holes. And a bank-funded dam in India that will flood tens of thousands of people out of their homes has been the target of angry protests. Bank officials admit to past mistakes, but they insist that's history. 
It was the biggest summit of all time, with the most ambitious agenda ever conceived for planetary change. But just how close did it come to meeting the world's expectations? Less than desirable, but more than I think we did expect. On most things, there were mixed reviews. Agenda 21, the 800-page program for peaceful coexistence between man and his environment, got fairly good marks, at least on paper. If you read the titles of the chapters in it, it looks pretty good. If you read the detail, it's not so hot. Missing, for example, were specific solutions for population control and nuclear waste. But the biggest omission of all was money. With few exceptions, industrialized nations refused to say when they would provide the additional funds needed to finance the plan. This is Yucca Mountain, Nevada. The dry, windy landscape could become a dump for the nation's most dangerous nuclear waste. A lot of people don't like that idea. It's too close to our homes. They should take care of it where they make the waste. None of the nuclear waste that might be stored in Nevada is made in Nevada. 90% of it is generated east of the Mississippi River, and yet they want to ship it all here to Nevada. The U.S. sits on more than 84 million tons of very dangerous nuclear waste. Right now, there's no place to store it. The federal government has ordered 14 states to build dumps, but when it comes to nuclear waste, a lot of Americans simply say, not in my backyard. Scientists are trembling at the discovery that the Farallon Islands, one of the nation's most famous marine reserves, sits atop a nuclear dump site, a leaking dump site. Half a mile down, government video shows barrels of nuclear waste, cracked, broken, and probably leaking. 